Good morning. Uh, today we are going to talk to Professor Sola Onulade, a professor and a researcher at the Center of Environmental Management. Welcome, Prof. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and I'm happy to be here. Uh, Prof, can you share with us how did you become a researcher? Um, actually, um, the interest to become a researcher started when I was doing my PhD. Um, I was working as an environmental consultant and um, in doing those research, you know, I found out that I loved the challenges it brought in terms of finding solutions, you know, to environmental problems. And I decided that um, this is really what I wanted to do. I want to make a difference, you know, in terms of the preservation of our heart, not just for our generation, but also for future generations. So to me, um, what I'm doing is not just about um, working or having a career, it's about a passion, you know, I enjoy doing it. I love the nature. So I think that that is what brought me into research in the environment. Thank you so much, bro. Uh, what are you currently working on? Um, actually, right now I'm working on the Water Energy Food Nexus, which is actually looking at how you look at the synergetic and the trade-off between uh, using water, energy, and uh, food as a resource and also in terms of how you take a resource from the environment you know in those use it in those three sectors so those are some of the things that I'm working on because uh, in the past research has focused just on looking at it as a single sector in terms of water you know people work on water separately they work on energy separately they work on food separately but now research has shown that if you want to actually manage resources effectively we need to look at how the three sectors are actually interlinked and um, my other focus is uh, looking at the circular economy which fits into the water energy food nexus as well because in the past we just took um, we used to uh, work in a um, in a nature and in an environment whereby we look at the media whereby we take resources and then release it back in a polluted form into the environment. But nowadays we are saying instead of releasing it back into the environment, we need to recycle it. Okay? We need to remediate it and then take it back into the society and then we reuse it. So instead of us polluting the environment or taking new resources from the environment, we are actually recycling, you know, our resources. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, coming back to water, what is water footprints so much important? Why is it so much important? Yeah, um, actually the water footprint is the amount of water you use, you know, in producing a product, you know, how long the product uh, chain, the different phases. For example, if you want to produce bread, for example, you only think about maybe the water that the baker, the baker used in producing the bread. But if you want to calculate the water footprint, you must think about how much water was actually used, you know, to plant the million million of the maize that was used, you know, to to, um, to produce the bread. And then you need to think about how much water also was used in actually processing the million million to become a fine flour as well that we eventually use in the baking, you know. And then, you know, eventually the water that was actually used in the baking itself. So those are some of the things that you have to calculate along the food chain. So it's not just the final word, I mean the quantity of water that you use in producing the final product, you need to start to think about how much water you use in actually producing the raw material for the product as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Prof, looking at artificial intelligence, what role can you play in environmental management? Oh, it can play a very huge role actually. Because in environmental management, often at times we have to go to the field and we collect data over a long period of time and some of those data are quite large and voluminous and to be able to process them it takes you know a longer time with ai we'll be able to do it faster you know and um, it's going to be like um, a quick um, step on the button and then things happen wow you know? so I, I think it's it's going to be a much easier future for us you know if we learn to use ai in environmental monitoring thank you so much uh, Prof, are there any exciting gaps within your field? Oh yeah, there are gaps that um, uh, that are actually we doing research on. We're trying to see, um, because some of my students are also working on that, how we can use natural materials you know, that are indigenous to where we're living to actually remediate 
polluted soil and also polluted water as well. So in the essence, we are saying that um, you don't really have to necessarily go to the lab or use a cost-effective, you know, I mean, use a very costly method, you know, to start to remediate polluted lands and also polluted water. So now we are saying we can find some plants that grow in our natural environment that we can use you know, to actually remediate our water or to actually clean up our environment. So those are some of the things that we are now trying to do research on, which is going to be more cost-effective, cost especially in Africa, whereby we don't have enough revenues, you know, our infrastructure is failing us, so we need those kind of materials to help us. Thank you so much, Prof. And then taking into cognizance our environment, it is facing a very serious challenges. Looking at the global warming, pollution, and waste disposal. So what's your take on that? I think everything goes back to human behavior. Okay? We think that our resources is so vast and that we can continue to misuse it the way we like. And I always tell people and my students as well, I said, if we continue to do business the way we do it as usual, we will find out that um, the future generation will find nothing to use I mean, in terms of living in a more healthy environment. So what we give to the environment is what the environment gives back to us. So we need to change our behaviors. We need to um, produce with less resources from the environment, and then we need to um, make sure that we recycle our materials so that we have less waste going into the environment as well. We need to start reusing some of the things that we think are waste. And also, you know, some of the things that I do as research is that some of the things that are actually waste in one sector can be a resource in another sector. So, so those are some of the thinking. And then we need to tell people and say, um, we, for example, when you use water, you know, use it in a more wiser way. When you see a pipe, you know, that is leaking, you know, report it. Don't just walk by and say it doesn't concern you. So everything depends on we humans. So we humans are actually the main cause of what is happening in our environment. Thank you so much. And then coming back to to Africa as a continent, are, are we playing our role in terms of mitigating the challenges of environmental? Uh, I will say we are trying, but you know, um, one of the things um, that we lack in Africa is we lack the, the financial like the financial power, the human capacity. So we need to train more people, you know, um, that actually understand what it means um, to be an environmental manager, for example. And also in terms of infrastructure, we lack the infrastructure. We need good technology, you know. So there's so many things that Africa lacks and is making us to lack and lack behind. So what we need to do is that we need to look within ourselves. We don't really, sometimes we are always looking at a solution from the north, okay, to think that that is going to work for us in Africa. But we need to look within ourselves and say our solution is within Africa. And that is why Africans need to do research within Africa, you know, that will give us solutions that will solve our own problems. You know, if we continue to look at um, the North America or the European solution to solve our solutions, we may make a mistake. Thank you so much. And Prof, coming back to South Africa now, we are facing poor service delivery. And then one challenge is waste disposal. So what message can you give the local government about waste disposal? Very good. Number one thing that I notice is that we don't separate our waste. Because every time the municipality comes you know, pick our waste in front of our houses, you know, with those black black bags, everything is mixed together. You know, often at times I have to bring my plastic bottles to campus for the same. So we need to start, maybe the municipality can start giving incentive to people and say, if you separate your waste, you know, then there will be an incentive for you. You know, the kind of incentive depends on the municipality. And then also we need to start, you know, thinking about 
the plastic bottles, the, pla I mean, the glass bottles, how can we recycle it instead of dumping everything in the landfills? And the landfills are fast filling up because we dump everything there. The landfill should be the last resort. You know? It shouldn't be the only way of disposing waste. So I will say to the municipality, get people who have the knowledge, the awareness, and the skill you know, to occupy positions you know, within the different roles you know, and capacity within the municipality that can help them in terms of waste management. So coming back again to awareness, are there any programs and awareness raising that will be able to mitigate this environmental challenge? Well, I will say that you know, um, you know, they do talk about it, you know, in on the newspapers, you know, on TVs. But if you ask an average South African working on the street, and you just say, do you know about waste management? Do you know about separation of the different? They will tell you no. Yeah. So that tells you that the awareness is very little. Very few people are aware about it. And if you ask people and they say, do you know about global warming? Do you know that uh, water is scarce? They will say, ah, I turn on my tap every day, water yes, comes out. Yes. So I don't really understand what you're saying. So it, it goes on to tell us that, you know, the awareness is very legit. We need to make sure we take it to the communities. We need to tell them that, look, this thing, it's, it's very urgent. So we cannot pretend that there is no problem anymore. We cannot pretend that there is no global warming anymore. We cannot pretend that, you know, we accumulating a lot of waste which our landfills you know, cannot handle. So we need to go and tell people in the communities, in the township, you know, and in a more friendly way and let them know, like, bring your waste, separate your waste, you know, and we'll pay you, you know, for the bottles, for the plastics. You will see people they'll be exalted. You know. That is how you can do it. You know. So and like I said before, business as usual will not help us. So, are we making progress in terms of integrating environmental measures into national policies, strategies, and planning? That is a very good question. South Africa has a very good policy, very good policies. The problem is the implementation. Why is there a slow implementation? You know, the people to implement it. You need to have the skill, you need to understand it before you can implement it. I'm sorry to say, but often at times the people that are occupying this position don't have the required skills to implement it. And also some of the policies that we have have to be backed with evidence, which is science. And that is why you know, sometimes when they want to implement policy or when they want to start um, are making decisions, you need to bring scientists that have done research on this thing to help them to understand how to implement this policy. So those are some of the so a lot of these are not talking to one another. That is the problem that we are having. So we I always advise the government and say there are people that understand these things. You know, we're training people in the university and give them the positions, the right positions, you know. Because the university is giving them the capacity to be able to go out there and do this thing. So if we put the right people in the right position, you will see they will do the right thing. Thank you so much, bro. And then what message can you share with aspiring researchers? Oh, I think um, research is a passion. You know, um, if you're looking to be very rich <laughs> or make lots of money, <laughs> research is not it's not I mean, I'm not saying you're going to be poor if you're a researcher, but you, you have to have the passion for it because research is about finding solutions to problems. So if you don't have the passion for it, it will be difficult for you to be a good researcher. So money comes second, you know, you will be okay. But <laughs> you need to think about finding the gaps, okay, and then looking for a way to fill the gaps. Thank you so much, bro. And then, apart from research, what are your other interests? 
Oh yeah, everything is just not about research. <laughs> I love to sing. Many people don't know that I love singing. Um, I think I've started singing since I was a very small in church, and so I've always been in the choir. You know that is something I love. And also, I I love reading as well, um, and, and I love watching movies. Okay. <laughs> and then I have my <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, bro. And then last thing, uh, it's about mental health. What message can you share with us on maintaining this mental health? Yes. I think it, uh, to maintain a mental health, you must have a balanced life. Because um, if you're an happy person and uh, you're unhappy with your environment, with your work environment, with, with your home environment, there's no way you will have a good mental health. So um, I would say, uh, for me, uh, I believe that um, it's not just about my work, you know. Sometimes I need to leave it, I need to go out there, um, you know, um, have some fun, meet with friends, and make sure that uh, at home as well, you know, um, the home environment is also very conducive for me as well. But often at times what happens is that um, many people are very stressed, especially we academics. Academics can be very stressful. So w when you're working so hard and you're stressed, and then your home environment is also very stressful, you know, then things are not working well, it's not balanced. So sometimes also you need to see a professional if you see that things are not going the way it's supposed to go before it becomes too uh, depressing for you. So because you find that sometimes people commit suicide and all this kind of things because the mental health is not good enough. So I am saying it's not just about doing the research and everything. Sometimes you need to balance it with a very good like Go out there, you know, take some time off, meet friends, you know, um, have fun, you know, just to relieve your stress. I think that is one of the ways that I do it. Thank you so much, Doctor. And before we conclude, let's go back to the SDG 13, it talks about uh, the climate action. Mm. So, as, as a nation, what action can we take to ensure that we, as humans, are playing our role in maintaining a good environment? Mm. Yeah, climate action. Yes. Number one, you know, I think I, I publish an article on that is, and I think we're trying to do that now in South Africa, we need to move to renewable energy, okay? We need to start relying less on coal from a source of energy. It's not going to be easy to just move away from it, but I think we're doing it little by little, so at least we're doing something. And also, um, we also need to think about, we're talking about the issue of waste as well, because often at times some of the landfills we we burn that, we burn the waste. Okay, and when you burn the waste, it gives us a lot of greenhouse gases, which eventually goes into the environment. You know, so um, so the less waste we generate, and the less waste that goes into the landfill, the less we is we incinerate, the better for the environment. And also in terms of um, planting trees as well, you know, don't forget if you cut one tree, make sure you plant five instead. Because those trees are one of the main things that help us to clean up our, our atmosphere and, you know, and give us good heat to breathe. So those are some of the things that we need to think about. So in that, and that is what we call land use change. So we clear off the forest, we clear off the trees to make ways for more buildings, and we forget to plant more instead of it. So those are some of the ways we need the strategies. And I would say right from primary schools, we need to start teaching our children, the smaller children, about the environment. Tell them how to plant trees. Tell them what the environment is so that these children grow up to understand, you know, that the environment that they live in is very important and vital for their health. Thank you so much, the Prof, for your time and thank you for sharing with us. No, it's a pleasure. Um, I must say this is something that is very, very um, uh, close to my heart and I'm very passionate about this. I've always um, excited to talk about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.